man. Everything, but everything seemed to be in our favor now. Even the weather was kinder, and we must have advanced about eight miles under a curtain of continuous fire, both until both Italians and Germany were ready to give in and were running to be captured. So think about this scene with just massive fire, and you're advancing under that fire for eight miles. They get, um, they're, they're doing this, they're continuing to advance in this part in here. Messerschmitts buzzed the area, spraying the ground spasmodically and causing those nearest to drop quickly into convenient holes. We pushed on at a steady pace past demolition guns, past demolished guns and supply dumps, the air stinking with appalling butchery. I glanced instinctively towards a, Shell burst 50 yards away as I watched its jet black smoke belch skyward. My gaze was transfixed by something odd on the ground. I wondered if it could be a human. Drawing nearer, I saw that it was the roasted body of a man in the sitting position. He must have been driving a scout car or light vehicle as there were small pieces of charred, twisted metal spread 50 feet around with dismembered arms and legs torn and blood-soaked uniforms littering the black scorched soil. The aroma was diabolical. Someone accidentally brushed the sitting form on passing and the body simply disintegrated with a sickly sound. Fast forwarding a bit, the smell of burnt flesh coat floated in my direction and I quickly and I quickened my pace to get clear of it. Plodding on in these awful, humid, and dusty conditions, I think I felt almost immune to weariness and the shocking sights of war. Nothing seemed to be able to stop us now. And this is, again, you got to read this book, but this sort of concludes this section. The 1st Parachute Brigade Group was not destined to take part in the final push to Tunis. Our role in the campaign had come to an end and we were withdrawn from the line. So ending five months hard slog. And again, that I mean, we're just burning through this book and I'm skipping so many sections. This stuff is, fi- this is five months. This is half a year just about of this type of fighting. Originally trained as shock troops in Tunisia, After the initial parachute assaults, we had served as plain infantry. But that's just the way the wind blew for us. Medals were plentiful, and all ranks had earned them. Eight distinguished service orders, 15 military crosses, nine distinguished conduct medals, 22 military medals, three croix de guerre, and one legion d'honneur. In their own way, even our German adversaries had recognized the brigade's fighting ability by naming us the Red Devils. For those who were there, though, the price of success was unspeakably high. We had lost more than 1,700 men, killed, wounded, or missing. So, again, I hate to burn through five months of insane fighting. And and I'll, I'll take a dig at, at Reg right now. Like, he's so matter-of-fact about stuff, and he only hits on the high points. I'm hitting on the high points of the high points, right? Mm. Just insane. Insane to think about that for five months. So... Uh, From there, they're transported from Tunisia back to Algeria, and they spend time training for a drop into Sicily, a parachute drop into Sicily, which, once again, you're fighting in Africa. Look, it's really tough conditions in Africa. Now you're getting closer to Germany. Like, you're going going into Sicily. You know what's waiting for you. It was hoped that if Sicily could be taken, it might prompt an Italian surrender. A large proportion of my battalion, including myself, now went down with dysentery. 
goes into talking about a lot of that. This is no, this is just, it's like no, nothing's easy. Between exercises, we acclimate, acclimized our reinforcements to use every, to use every type of enemy weapons, including Schmeiser automatic, which we found superior to our own Sten gun. So now they start uh, preparing for this mission in Sicily. There were three bridges to take in Sicily. <clears throat> and the password for them was to be desert rats with the reply, kill Italians. As the plane took off, Chunky said, well, this is it, our second operation. I tried to act normally, but could feel the sweat running down my cheek. So once again, he's stifling some emotions. <laughs> and here they go, getting on this, getting ready to do this drop. And this is just, it's just crazy. As we drew nearer to our objective and at a thousand feet, I could see the flak and tracer zipping past the wing of the aircraft. For 30 minutes, we dodged everything they threw at us, but it was a tense half hour as we were helpless to do anything. So you're in an airplane, you're getting ready to parachute, and there's flak bombs exploding around you trying to take down your your aircraft. And tracer fire zipping. You know how much protection an aircraft gives you from tracer fire, from machine gun fire? Zero. What's flak? So it's um, anti-aircraft. They set it for a certain altitude. It goes up in the air and then just blows up okay. in hopes that some of that shrapnel will hit the aircraft and damage the aircraft and take them down. Gotcha. So flak jacket. is to you know, So flak, actually flak is... Just little chunks of it's fragmentation, right? It's yeah. Little chunks of metal that that come off of an explosive device, like a grenade or a artillery round mm. that are, that's going to blow. Like on purpose, yes, purpose. Like that's what yep. it's for. And then a flak jacket is to protect like, you from flak. Gotcha. So, and in the old days, like the flak the term, term flak jacket, the flak jacket would protect you from flak. It wouldn't protect you from a bullet, right? Because flak isn't going as fast. Yeah. As a bullet is. Like so a, like, like an old school Vietnam flak jacket yeah. wouldn't stop bullets. But it would protect you from flak. Yeah. Like motorcycle jacket kind of thing. Like it's like it'll it'll protect you but not from the, the real deal. Yeah. 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 So even so even nowadays, right, the expression like don't give me any flak. Mm-hmm. It's like kind of that. Yeah. 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 It's exactly. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. So these guys are up there and like he says helpless. And by the way, this is a half an hour of this. <sighs> suddenly we were given continuing on suddenly we were given the order to hook up I did so and waited the engines cut back on the approach to our drop zone we descended to around 600 feet with all sorts of rubbish whizzing by and the plane pitching and tossing like a toy in a vast vacuum then there came a terrific explosion as our tail was hit the order jump man jump screamed in my ears and I tumbled through the doorway into the void below so the aircraft finally takes a devastating hit. He doesn't. He doesn't mention whether the aircraft made it or not. He just says that it. You know, the tail was hit hard. I can't imagine that's super easy to fly a plane once the tail's been blown off. Now he gets on the ground again. Fast forward a little bit. On the ground, about three hundred yards in my left, was the main coastal road to the town of Cat- Catania. And enemy traffic was in tremendous confusion. To my rear, I could hear Italian voices, and about 100 yards to my right, Germans rapping out orders. Then down the road came a 15-strong German patrol. They could have been parachutists, judging by their dress and headgear. Fortunately, I was not alone when they were just a few yards off, and we opened up on them. There were some grunts, groans, and sickly yelps, then silence. We slipped on in the direction of the bridge, around which our men were by now silently killing, harassing, and panicking the German and Italian defenders. At night, small battles raged unceasingly, and we were pinned down for a long time by mortar fire. When daylight broke, though, I saw for the first time the vast mountain scenery at the base of which we had been fighting. Again, I'm I'm just jumping through stuff. Then the sun starts to come up. It became warm. And then the heat became intense. A typical. You're never, you, you can never just be comfortable. 
it's always like freezing cold or too hot. You would you, he had 15 minutes where it was warm and then they were too hot. There had been no firing for some time and I realized that the enemy was no longer with us. Scanning the countryside, I could see burnt out cars, Italian tanks, and ammunition dumps. The smell of burnt bodies and oil filled the air. I was glad to move on. Such a confusion of our brigade, such was the confusion of our brigade drop that come daylight, three men from, th- the men from three para discovered they spent all night fighting alongside the men of first para without realizing it. At the bridge, it was clear that there had been a fierce battle. The pillboxes had been rushed and dealt with ruthlessly. Here, the brigade mustered approximately 180 men, but the three-inch mortars and ammunition had not arrived, and there was a lack of communication with outside units. Wireless sets, those are radios, had been either incorrectly netted back in Africa, were damaged on the landing, or just did not arrive. We learned that German parachutists from the 3rd Regiment of the 1st Fallschirmjäger Division had dropped simultaneously on our drop zone the previous night. So we must have indeed have brushed shoulders with them when we came upon that 15-man patrol. How crazy is that? You're jumping into a drop zone and the Germans are jumping in there too. (laughs) And then he goes, as things start to escalate, he's talking about how hot it was like hot as in not heat temperature, but hot as in enemy action. Little wonder things were so warm. The area within an approximately two mile radius of the bridge was festooned with 88 millimeter and 20 20 millimeter guns, pillboxes, machine gun pits, and also a few coastal guns. And we were engaging with crack German troops, including paratroops. They presented a good target whenever they got too near the bridge. You could not miss, but word went around that our supply of ammunition was now drastically low. Conserve ammunition and fire only when you are absolutely certain of a kill, was the order. But due, in due course, members of the 1st and 3rd para battalions at the northern end of the bridge withdrew to join us at the southern end. The enemy was getting harder to ward off as tanks and tanks began to appear. Now we got tanks, enemy tanks on the scene. We were using captured Italian 40 millimeter anti-tank gun along with our own anti-tank gun. The battle worked up to a terrific climax. The Germans were sending their best troops in an effort to shift us, their paratroopers probing for weak spots and allowing no respite. Food was in our haversacks, but there was no time to get it. It was fire, fire, and keep on firing. Finally, there was a lull at about 1830 or soon after, giving us a chance to take stock. Maybe the Germans wanted to regroup. I checked my ammunition and found only four rounds left, plus one in the chamber. At 1930, we were ordered to withdraw in order to avoid capture and go in small groups. We made it off in a westerly direction toward the Gornalunug the Gorna Lunga River. If we could use the river and the road running parallel to it as a guide for a couple of miles, perhaps then we could be clear of any enemy concentrated attack. So these guys are basically bagging out of the area. And as they're doing it, they're doing it in small groups. Uh, At one point, as darkness fell, we came upon a deserted farmhouse, but decided not to enter as it was quite near an abandoned flak gun pit. We thought both sides would be We thought both could be booby-trapped. It was approximately 0200 by now. We were very tired and hungry. We dozed off in an orchard 20 feet from the edge, each man at the base of a different tree so as to be less conspicuous. So they spend the night in this um, orchard. And then they set off once again. We saw no more of the enemy. Violentini. We reached Augusta some 15 miles from Prima Sol Bridge, finding the town in our hands. It was a great sight to see so many of our own troops and tanks. And so they continue on, reaching Syracuse without mishap on the, on the 17th of July, just four days after dropping into Sicily. We soon set sail, arriving back at Sous in Tunisia on the 20th. Our first parachute brigade group had not only suffered heavily in the North African campaign, but in Sicily, too, where we had lost a further 300 men killed, wounded, or missing, it was time to rest, refit, regroup, and reorganize. And we also got to relax. 
So 